What's up everyone and welcome back to the channel. We've got a pretty cool one today. We're at the Forge in Nashville and Duncan here is gonna teach us a little bit of something about forging that I didn't know anything about. So everybody loves Damascus, but I'm gonna show you some different techniques that I think work better for culinary knives. A hundred layers, 200 layers, 400, 800, 1600. That's a lot of layers. It's done. And that's Damascus for you, right? It's yeah. a lot of labor intensive work of folding, hammering, beating, forging, over lots of room for error. Mm -hmm. Why do you choose to do something like a Samai or Gomai? But it's only three, like wouldn't it be weaker? No, not at all. By layering a hard core steel with a softer steel or an iron, it actually allows a lot of that kinetic energy to be absorbed up into the blade and into the handle a lot smoother versus giving a lot of pressure onto the cutting edge and allows you to have a more pliable and ductile blade on the hole while retaining that scalpel edge on a hardened core steel. So as far as Damascus, it's more of like a kind of a well-rounded blade, whereas the Sanmai is specifically great for edge retention and you know, cutting over and over and over and over and you over You can get again. a wicked mean edge with a softer spine and a little bit more pliability to it versus having a hard edge and being hyper brittle. So you have to worry about chipping or cracking or anything and like that. And you've got a lot more of places to chip and crack because you have so many different forge welds to make too. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Now traditionally at Horn and Heel, you like to do a lot of the Samai or Gomai stuff. Now Samai, again, traditionally is a softer wrought iron, not a lot of carbon, not a lot of hardness to it, more ductility mm -hmm. and soft metal sandwiched around something super hard. Yes. Right? So this is great for what you do. Mm -hmm. Now there's a difference between the Samai and Gomai. San means three, Go is five in Japanese. So it's just how many layers are going on. Usually with sand, there's a high, high carbon or a harder core, and then it's jacketed with either a stainless or a mild steel or a wrought iron, something that has a lower carbon content. Okay. What we prefer to do is go mine, which is five. We actually like to introduce two little layers of pure nickel in between pure the nickel. two. Pure oh, nickel. that's gotta add some good benefits in there. Absolutely. What it does, aside from this sleek little lightning bolt it has at the end after the etching, it actually reduces carbon migration between the high carbon core oh. and then the low carbon jacketing. Okay, so all the high carbon that's in here the carbide precipitation as you get up into those transformation temperatures can't yes. get through the, the nickel. Exactly. The nickel keeps it from getting into this, making this now brittle. Retains it all in the core so that you have that ripping edge and that softer exterior. And when you etch it, it's super sexy. So good. I'm super stoked to slap these together. So what do we gotta do next? We gotta take the wrought iron, surface it clean so that it has a nice flat surface that we can adhere to everything else. Once we get it all tightened up, we're gonna grind them all flat all the way around. Prep it, and yeah. we're gonna get the machine set up. We're gonna get welding, but while we're doing all that, you're gonna get the forges on, rolling, rocking. Oh, that's hot. Get, get it up to that temperature that oh, we yeah. need so we're ready to go, because that could take some time. And Parker's over here, we're gonna trim things up. Parker, why, why is it important that we get these all the same size? We got to get to weld up properly, and there's a lot of surface inclusions or cold shuts on the outsides of these billets that we got to clean off so that they don't spread into the billet as we forge weld them up. What's next? We're going to make sure it's all dead square, and then we're going to acetone and wipe it down so it's all super clean. We're going to square it up, clean it up, and then go make it. Then go make it. We got it. Everything's cleaned up. It's clamped together. No high-low or anything. Everything's smooth. So now we got to make sure that this hot glue gun, as you guys like to call it, is set properly. The machine does give you some settings as far as what wire diameter and what material you're working on. We've got somewhere around 3 16th inch plate and we're running 035 size wire. This is gonna say somewhere around 26 volts and 475. That's a lot of beans. Beans? Beans. What do you mean? You, you, no savvy beans, frijoles. It's fine, you can run it, but and what I recommend is just making sure that you find that and then set it, write it down on the machine. We got 21 and 330. I think that's gonna be enough volt and enough wire to accomplish this weld. We wanna make sure that we weld all the way around this. The wrought iron is gonna be kind of gross to weld on. We're just gonna bear with it. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna start right, not on the corner. We're gonna start a little bit ahead, push back and then pull. So all we're doing is just pulling it along. No motions, I'm not doing anything crazy. We're just trying to seal it up so there's no cold shuts or anything like that. Just keep going. There's not a whole lot to this. We're not looking for a pretty bead necessarily, but that's plenty hot. It's closing it up. You can see that travel speed was fairly quick too. Three eighths of an inch. So about that far away, mm -hmm. that wire is how you need to maintain. Okay. The further you are away, the crazier it's gonna get. The closer you are, you're not gonna be able to see. Mm -hmm. 
So that's the two beads that we got on there. We're gonna do this complete other side and I'm gonna let you run it. Oh, I missed the end. Yeah, cause you couldn't see. Yeah, I couldn't see, you're so Couldn't right. see. Just start here, pull back and then push all the way. So when, you're, when you did this, yeah, there's so much metal there, you yeah. can like start and go. You can light up, push back, pull forward. Slow down a little, right there. Now let's get the other two sides. We could probably pop these clamps off. Always try to weld it flat if you can. Okay. Give a little bit of a weight. Right when you know you're done, count to two. So instead of like get to the end and stop, go one, two, and then stop. And wait, there you go. That's just to see how we kind of fill in that little bit of a crater, no low spots that are like sinking in. Un mas. Beautiful. Solid as a rock. All right, uh, let's throw a handle on it and then we can slide. Oh yeah, the handle. Need. Put the handle where you want it. And I'll, and then... I'll tacky tacky. All right, bro, so the, the metal's in the forge. We're Bill, it's in the forge. How hot do we gotta get it before we get it? We need to get about 2,100 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, 2,100 yeah. degrees. Welding tent. Can we go higher? We can, but you don't really wanna go too high. That nickel can start to kind of melt and get too gloopy. So we wanna keep it about 2,100 degrees. Best. About yellow to white hot is what we're looking for. So yeah. you're really focusing on, on looks instead of a time. You're not sitting there. No. And we're gonna pull it out and get to beating on it on the handle? No, hell no, no. So we're actually gonna take it straight to the 16 ton uh, press, hydraulic press. It's gonna make a nice, clean, even weld. Do one tiny little set. And then once it's set, it should be good to actually pull all the way out to a long billet. To, to people that are brand new to blacksmithing, you think that they normally wanna pull it out and just get to hammering on yeah, it. That's yeah. not how you set a weld. You can, but the problem with that is when you come down, if you're not dead square on the entirety of the piece right away, what you can do is bow up all that welding we just did. So we want it flat. Dead flat. Dead flat. Yeah. Set the weld, then get to beating. That was dramatic. I know, but that, doing that first set is so important to make sure all those welds get situated. After that, we're going to be able to stretch the billet out to about 24 inches. So you've done two sets now. Are you gonna flip it or rotate it anymore? We're gonna do two more. So I rotate it every time, make sure everything stays nice and level and even. And then once I feel pretty secure in it, after any pots, I'm gonna go in and take a little bite out of the front and start to slowly squish it all the way down. We're gonna isolate the pressure so there's more impact on what we're actually making contact with. Keeping that heat in the billet is so important. So like, those plates are just gonna, or heat sinks, so they just suck it out every time. So you just need a little pop, put it back in, get it right back up the temp so it's not really changing anything. Keeping things hot is important. 100%. It's, it stresses the metal out way less. Way less. The top and bottom are rot, and they have that little bit of scale build up from the forging process when we stretched it out to make it a, a little section. So it's just hitting that scale. If that cools down, that's not the biggest deal in the world, but if that, a heat seat penetrates down to the nickel and the core steel where the lamination is, that's where you get the pops, that's where it separates. That feels good. If it was gonna do something, it was right then. Hot steel is plasticine, basically. It's like working with clay cold. A lot of Damascus makers, they'll take two different types or two different colors of like Play-Doh or clay and they'll put them together, cut, fold, chop, and see how their patterns are gonna develop because they can actually see it. <laughs> Who would have thought playing with some Play-Doh later on in life actually pays off? Pay off, I just ate it. These gloves were great. Now we're drawing her out. Drawing her out. Now when you've got it like it's bananaed right now, that doesn't bother you? Flip it, 
it'll come over and if it gets too out of whack, I actually do come back to the anvil to give it a good straightening. All right. I'm gonna do, I'm gonna switch the dies out after the last squish just to flatten it all out and that's it. All right, dude, so we got a stopper in there now so you don't go too deep. Exactly. So that cold piece of steel stops the press from going all the way down. I can keep the hot piece of metal at a consistent thickness so it's exactly where we want it to be instead of having peaks and valleys all the way through that we're gonna have to grind out or make the pattern look inconsistent. And then on the final run, you're gonna switch the dies to all, all the way flat so you can get it nice and Dead flat, flat clean bar. We can grind out from there. Slap in the vise, keep it straight. We had a, a nice block of steel with all five pieces in there, about two inches wide and three and a half tall. Yep, about an inch thick. We got it stretched out to close to 17 inches, I think we measured. It's two and a half wide and about a quarter. Three sixteenths. Three sixteenths round about. Man, it looks great. And just like a Martha Stewart cooking show, we've got the finished product laid out right here so you don't have to wait for the good stuff. What we got is the end product of what we did today. Rod iron clad, nickel liners, and then the core is high carbon. Stainless brother to it, same situation. This one's sexy. Stainless, the nickel, the black coffee etch. Ooh, oh, you buddy. I would lick it, but it'd cut me. Yeah, it would. And then all these guys are our mono steels. That way it's one solid cohesive unit of steel. It's just gonna stay tough and etch sharp. Give them your shameless plug. Where can they find you? Where can they buy it? We're Horn & Heel. Been out for about 10 years. We're in Nashville, Tennessee. You can find us at Horn & Heel on Instagram and www. Hornheel.com. You heard it here, folks. Guys, thanks for watching. We'll see you on the next one.